start by actually talking about veterans in general, what the experience is while they're in the military, and what the experience is, uh, what, what kind of experiences they have when they get out of the military is a chance to see for their life. That's kind of framing the, the problem, and then I'll go and talk about the cause. So, um, so in general, you know, when, when a soldier goes through boot camp, they're put through intense physical and psychological training procedures that changes them uh, forever, okay? So there's a personal and social, social, social identity change. They get in the boot camp, completely shaped. They're given a name tag, and all wear the same uniform. Um, and uh, your previous identity is systematically broken down to form of a new identity. Uh, social identity changes, your friends, your family, they all suddenly take a back seat, your battle buddy or your you know, members of the unit, they become the most important people in your lives, okay? Uh, there's a different kind of attachment and bonding that develops while they're in the military. It's very intense, um, you know, because just because of the very intense experiences they go through together as service uh, personnel. Um, and that kind of bonding is nothing like uh, what, you know, most of our experience in the civilian world is like, just because of the experiences there. And recruits during the training are taught, uh, there's a whole military culture, you know, they're taught one, obey authority without question. Like I remember when I enlisted, uh, first day, the sergeant comes and says, hey, there's one golden rule in this place. Your officer or sergeant is always right. And there's another goal, goal this, she said there are two rules. The first rule is the, the sergeant is always right. The second rule is if you think that the sergeant is wrong, refer back to rule number one, <laughs> okay? So that's, that's, that's a kind of, I think now it's changed a lot. I don't think it was like this and uh, it's, like, it's like this anymore, but things have changed a bit, but still they have this thing that yes sir, no sir, you have to obey authority without question. Of course it, it is relevant in military context. It doesn't apply in a civilian context. And then they're also trained to be in a state of constant hypervigilance. They're always alert, okay, now uh, where is a potential threat coming from? Where, you know, where is, because they're always looking around, they're always aware of movements, people, you know, uh, it's a, so they're it's kind of trained to be in a state of the opposite of what it is, what you call being calm and, and, and collected and, and, and at ease, they are constantly trained to be like that. And third, they are also trained to always put the group ahead of the individual. So if the mission is what matters most, the safety of the group matters most. Even if you are suffering, even the sick, even if you, uh, you know, need to see a therapist, for example, you have to shelf all of that because you could sabotage the mission. It's always putting the group ahead of the individual. So these are the ethics uh, they are trained and cultured in while in the military. And besides that, the other things, other kinds of stresses that they experience, uh, being away from the family, especially if they deployed, you know, uh, all around the world, US military personnel go all around the world for, for deployment. And even during deployment, they experience a change in their duties. Like it's quite common for someone to be a infantry person, you know, in combat, in a, in a combat role. And then because of various reasons, injury or whatever, they switch to becoming a cook. So uh, they have to also cope with, with stresses when they change their, their location in the military. Um, and another issue is envy and competition because in a military um, environment, everyone wears more or less very similar clothes, similar holidays, uh, similar pay structure based on the rank. So little perks that each individual gets, maybe an extra nights off or a day off, can be cause for great envy in a situation like that. Uh, and of course, for those who have experienced uh, combat, there's physical and psychological residues that continue to remain uh, in them even after they've been discharged from service. And so when they return, when they decide, like the, the students I have are people who served sometimes you know, between five years to 10 years, even 15 years. So what happens when they leave that environment and rejoin uh, our world, 
Okay, what kind of stresses do they experience? Okay, so um, one is the tragedy to return to civilian life. Um, you know, they don't know what to expect. Disadvantages in the labor market in college because the skills that they have, they have been trained with may not match with what the current labor market demands. You know, maybe technological skills, writing skills, uh, speaking skills. So those kind of uh, disadvantages uh, causes of stress. And then of course you have other things like the disabilities they carry with them. Sometimes they look, you know, they might look completely perfectly okay, but you just don't know they may have some sort of, you know, issues, the elbows, the knees. Uh, and very often, you know, uh, the VA prescribes them, uh, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, pharmaceutical remedies which have side effects and may in turn cause addiction. Um, and then, of course, PTSD or PT, you know, post traumatic stress injury. Um, and all of these can also sort of um, become a vicious cycle that can lead to more and further anxiety, depression, and uh, also insomnia because uh, they're not used to sleeping regular hours uh, because of the service. So, this is what they're really dealing with. Uh, and unfortunately, the way it happens is that they are more or less thrown into civilian, civilian life. There's no like, okay, let's have some place where you can transition. The moment you sign the papers, you're out there and out there fend, fend for yourself in the, in, the, you know, the, in, the, in the jungle of, uh, of, this, of the world out there, the civilian life out there. So they experience, you know, sometimes unresolved grief and loss. And also when they come back to the world, very often, you know, this is, it might not be what they recognize when they left, you know, the changing ethics, in the world. Um, so these are things which they cannot understand, you know, sometimes or, or be attuned to. So changes in society, homeland, um, and what do they do? So one thing that is, that is you know, not, not uncommon among veterans is they cope with this through dysfunctional uh, mechanisms. Uh, one thing is common is just being silent about it, denying that they, they need help because it's seen as a weakness while they're serving, it's almost seen as a weakness to approach, uh, to book a therapy or see a counselor. You know, it might be seen as a malingering. You know, you don't want to show up. So it's denial and silence, bitterness, uh, bitterness and anger, especially if they feel that the war or the deployment that they've been asked to do is not a popular war. It's unpopular war, for example. Um, and so sometimes they also experience you know, they get into substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, um, like I mentioned, all of these also ends up in depression. And uh, I'm very sad to share this with you, but suicide is uh, kind of common, uh, you know, um, thing, common, common phenomena that they experience. Uh, in 2018, there was a peak in the number of veteran suicides. Uh, it's gone down slightly, but 226,146 veteran suicide deaths. And um, if you look at this, uh, out of those, um, the leading cause of death for veterans among uh, under age of 45, suicide is the second uh, most uh, you know, cause of death for young, younger veterans. So we really have a problem, um, but you know the VA does invest quite a lot of um, funds in trying to take care of veterans. Uh, and in Manhattan, Manhattan College, we have a nice veterans program. We call it Veterans at Ease. So basically what we do is we, uh, I teach a course called the Nation Experience of Religion. This is a freshman course. So veterans take this course with other traditional students. And the course is designed in such a way that it includes topics of interest to them. It includes topics such as on, on yoga, stress reduction, uh, we also take them on a stress reduction retreat. Um, you know, we used to go to the Bahamas a few years ago at the Shivananda Ashram. Uh, but you now because of you know, financial reasons, we can now go upstate. There's a really beautiful uh, lodge uh, in, in, in called, you know, it's, it's by the YMCA, it's called East Valley Lodge. So we have really beautiful lodge to ourselves and we invite uh, yoga instructors who are specially trained to teach veterans to impart uh, breathing skills, meditation, and other stress reduction techniques. 
So as part of that, as part of the objectives of the overall program, I started a summer course um, using the Mahabharata as a background narrative for veterans to connect to and share their own experiences uh, amongst each other. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about now. How is my course, you know, how is the Mahabharata relevant to addressing some of these issues? Okay. Um, so again, although I'm talking about veterans, I think that the, some of the issues that I'm going to bring up, bring up is, are quite universal. Um, and anyone who's experienced some form of transition stress, for example, I think can, can relate to these things. I hope that conversation from this, this talk will go beyond just veterans. Um, so before, before I move on, any questions or comments? Uh, anyone? Yes. The, the, the 6,146, is that US veterans? Yes, the US, it's only US veterans. Only US veterans. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So this course is also taught along with a philosophy uh, class. This is, uh, uh, I teach this one, uh, another colleague of mine in the philosophy department, he teaches the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I teach some Habar, okay, so this is the last year. So this uh, course was designed to help, um, you know, to get student veterans interested in themes of war, military service and transition, uh, specifically meant for them. So if you only have only have veterans in the class, we don't have traditional students. Uh, one reason is because we want to bring uh, build a community of people around the same age group. Because remember, the veterans are about minimum five, four to five years older than the traditional students. Okay, um, and we want to really try to promote education, empathy, and awareness amongst veterans, but not only veterans. Uh, it's also for, for you know, the public at large, what, what the veteran experience is. So I just want to reiterate the objectives of the cause. One is to build a close community for students. They all come together. We have a like, discussion kind of format in the classroom uh, that was designed and just for people to come together, make friends, have a social life. So they're friends of the same age group and same experiences. Um, like I mentioned, we create a, awareness uh, and empathy for veteran experiences, and also really to help prepare the veterans for what's out there. You know, uh, the, you know, like issues of on decision making, uh, ethics, uh, individual responsibility, social responsibility, dharma, okay? So, so to speak in, in Sanskrit language. Uh, the book I used, I used uh, this book by Guru Charan Das, The Difficulty of Being Good, The Successful Art of Dharma. It's a, it's a great book because he actually addresses these, these different themes. Um, and then also use sections of Ben Buchanan's about translations. Uh, having said that, both of these books right now don't completely fulfill my uh, objectives for the course. I'm kind of working on my own thematic uh, writing of the Mahabharata, just designed for teaching. Um, you know, uh, not just veterans, but anyone who's interested in digging further into the you know, ethical uh, uh, dilemmas that emerge from the Mahabharata that can be applicable in, in, in everyday life. So I, what I do, I focus on prominent characters, the Mahabharata, people, uh, you know, Bhishma, Duryodhan, Karna, Arjuna, Yudhishthira, Ashatama. So these are the characters I focus on. I'm gonna talk about each one of them. Uh, and how their dilemmas um, have some connections to, to veteran issues, the issues that I talked about early on. So this is just something technical. Basically the course, the assignments of this course is that they're online discussion forums. They do twice a week. Um, and then there's blog-like submissions. So this is where students write their own stories based on the uh, themes or the experiences of the characters from Mahabharata. I'll show you an example of it later on. And again, this the class is designed to ensure it's interactive and more discursive and not a lecture style or very academic oriented um, uh, course, although all the academic uh, you know, requirements were fulfilled, you know, like the writing requirements and so on. And then for the final project, instead of a, you having a final paper, which is, what, which is what most of our courses have. I had a final project where veterans can, exp can express their work in any creative form that they um, 
they have skills in. So I had people, for example, I students you making a handicraft related to the Mahabharata, students writing poetry, connect, connecting the own life story, the life story of one of the characters the Mahabharata. I had students writing Japanese uh, poetry, I think ha haiku, haiku, this was short poetry. I had students cook a meal for everyone based on one of the recipes from Mahabharata, all kinds of, so basically encouraging them following the theme of the Mahabharata, what is a dharma, who filled it? So, so using the same theme, I said, what, is, what, are you good, what are you good at? What is your skill? Discover yourself, express yourself. You don't have to write a five, 3,000 word essay. You know, that's basically uh, what the assignment was. All right, so now let's get into the gist of it. Um, so the first character I talked about was, was Bhishma. Um, so this is, you know, this, the, you know the, the, the story of how Bhishma basically, uh, while he was trained to be the next king of the, of the Guru dynasty, he was, and he was groomed to be, to be the heir of, of Santanu. He sacrificed his claim to the throne for the sake of his, so that his father can get married to Satyavati, right? So that's the story. Um, and in Bhishma's perspective, he made two vows. He said that one, I will not uh, become king. And two, I will not get married because I want, so that the, the children of, of Satyavati can become the heir to the throne. So he made those, made those two vows. So one of the questions we discussed was, was Bhishma right in sacrificing his claim to the throne? Uh, and this is interesting because this is of uh, relevant to veteran experiences because veterans very often go through the same thing, what they call shattered dreams. Because you know, I have students who tell me that when they joined the Navy, they wanted to be part of the Navy SEAL, you know, they watch Hollywood movies. And then this particular student ended up saying the part the last few years of his service, he just spent standing outside a gate and just checking IDs. You know, there's no glam to it. He went through all the he did a lot of great good things, but somehow for various reasons, he couldn't make it. And the men, this is not this is not an uncommon story, it's quite typical. So, how do you deal with that kind of you know, you know, this illusionment of what you wanted to 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 to, to do while in the military, what you ended up doing. Okay. Um, and then uh, Bhishma also the other the other thing we talked about is selfless acts. Um, group thing may not always be the best. What I mean by this, so like I mentioned early on, veterans are trained to always put the group before before themselves, which is great in a military context. But it might not always be the best thing in a civilian context. Let me give you an example. So every Thursday, one of the things we have, we have, we have this thing called open table uh, in our college, where all of us go to a, a restaurant or a bar next, next, to, next to, to our campus, uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And we just, you know, just talk about, we just socialize as a social gathering for veterans. So what happens sometimes, one of them decides they want to stay longer, drink a bit more than they should, um, you know, and basically, um, you know, and when, when that happens, the others feel pressure that I, I need to be there for this person, you know, I can't, I mean, an exam tomorrow, I may have assignments, I may have family responsibilities, all these other things I have, have to think about, but because they're trained to have this group thing, they kind of, okay, let's just be here with this person kind of thing, so we ask ourselves, so is it, is, is, is is selfless act always a good thing? Okay, so these are so in my presentation I have these quotes. BC represent, uh, is acronym for veteran comments. Uh, so these are comments that veterans have uh, written in their blog post or in the discussion post. I'm just sharing it with you, just to show you how they sort of uh, reflected and expressed the Mahabharata and interpreted the Mahabharata. So here it says here the selfless acts, you know, um, it's a noble thing, but it caused a succession drama in the Guru dynasty that caused so many lives, right? So what is important is that is that these acts have been accompanied by careful consideration of the consequences of one's actions. Bingo, this is what I wanted for them to think about, not just being selfless, but what is where are selfless acts going to get you? You know, what is the consequences of that? Uh, so here there's a comment here that says. It's great to be selfless, but use discernment and wisdom to determine which act uh, is the best. 
in which may fail to do this. This is why the comment is a bit confused. So there's Bhishma, so moving on to the next character, Duryodhan. So what emerged from reading about Duryodhan's uh, you know, personality was the theme of envy. It's also what the, the, the textbook suggested that I used. Um, so this is a quote for, uh, from the Mahabharata. And this happens after, you know, the, uh, the kingdom is divided to, between Hastinapur and Indraprastha and Yudhishthir develops in the Prashta and the, the Pandavas develop it and they conduct the Rajasriya uh, sacrifice. It invites everyone, including Duryodhan, and Duryodhan looks at you know, all the gifts that the Yudhishthir gets, the opulence of the assembly hall, and he develops a very strong envy against the Pandavas, right? Then he has this quote here, I've seen Pandu's son enjoying such dazzling fortune, I'm burning with resentment. Uh, and he even says that he's prepared to die. You know, I shall enter fire or solo poison or drown myself but because I cannot live to see the Pandava so successful. And then he says this interesting quote here. He says, what man of metal in this world could bear to see his rivals prosper and himself fail? So Duryodhan is justifying his envy, saying, look, if you're a real man, the real Chatriya, you're supposed to feel envy at your rival's success because if you don't, you won't be ambitious and you won't be successful. So that's the logic uh, of the reason. So we talked about arguments for and against envy. Some, you know, one student actually said, hey, actually, you know what? There is some, some truth to that. You know, unless you feel some sort of envy about someone else's achievements, you will not try to improve yourself. You will not try to work hard. So that was there. Uh, but for the majority of them, you know, they felt that um, military look, envy is, like I mentioned earlier, it's a quote from one of the veterans, you know, with, the, with the military being relatively more of an equal society with each specific pay grade, and it's even easier to come by, okay? And then they said that someone else said envy is unproductive, it's a waste of energy and emotions. Um, and envy just burns. Only the flames invoked by envy do not burn anyone but the envious person carrying it. And, and I had to include this, this little part here <laughs> for my own self. I'm very grateful for this class. We did love about this being an opportunity to do some serious reflection. By the way, the pictures I used are also the same pictures I used from the PowerPoints when I was teaching them, you know, uh, Mahabharata. So these are not just you know, random pictures, but these are the pictures which they reflected on while you know, we were really doing the course. So this is an example of the uh, the blog post that I talked about. So the theme here is envy. Behind is actually a picture of of Duryodhan, you can't really see because it's been blocked by these posts. The students will write their own little stories, you know, uh, experience of envy in the military, for example, and then, um, and then they read each other's stories, you know, and that's, I think that's a form of therapy, right? You write and you read other, other people's experiences to know that your experience in this one sense is, is unique, but it's also universal. Then moving on as the story progresses, uh, you know, the Trashtra and Duryodhan, they arrange for the, the you know, the, the gambling match in, in, in the Sabha Parva. And, um, and, you know, you all know what happens after that, you know, Yudhishthir loses all his wealth, everything, including his own brothers, and he stakes Draupadi, and Draupadi is dragged to the assembly hall. Uh, she's humiliated, um, and she asks for justice. So the, the main themes that come out of this is uh, how do you survive an unjust system? What do you do? And the second thing is what, what are the negative consequences of people in power who are silent? Okay. So the um, I had three female veterans in my class, and they could and all of them, you know, many of them felt that Draupadi is one of the favorite characters. She's the most, you know, I showed them the whole entire scene from the Chopra series, by the way, of, of Draupadi being dragged. There's a very powerful scene there. So uh, so one of them said that you know, this is female veteran, she said that Draupadi demonstrates a rightful distaste of impossibly patriarchal society she finds herself in. Um, and you know, and Draupadi is, she noted Draupadi, you know, they can look to Draupadi for drank to ask that the law was just because Draupadi went to each person, she went to the Trashtra, she went to Bhishma, she asked the question, did Yudhishthir take himself first or did he take me first? It was a legal technical question that astounded Bhishma, but she, what she was really doing was that she was really asking for 
uh, compassion uh, and justice. Okay, that is a, that's, that's what she's really asking for. So um, students shared stories of moments when they were witnesses to injustices in the military or when they're falsely accused. So this is where you hear all kinds of uh, interesting stories. Um, you know, one student shared the story of how he was accused of sexual harassment by a, by a female colleague when they were both of them exchanging love notes and later on they came to know that he was kind of framed because she actually wanted to get a transfer out to some other unit. So she used that incident to frame him. So all kinds of interesting stories of, you know, just because the military is a very hierarchical male dominated, male dominated society as well. Uh, and it's also relevant to obeying orders without questioning the drop of the incident um, sort of, um, you know, encourages us to speak, uh, you know, to authority, you know, to, to question public officials who are, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, silent, even in, in, you know, uh, to the point of um, passively allowing unjust, uh, unjust systems to operate. Um, so that was Draupadi, and then we talked about Karna. Karna, just like you know, the debates about Karna that happened in India. I had a short macrocosm of that in my class. It's very unexpected, very interesting. Karna is somehow, uh, you know, generates that kind of controversy. Um, actually, I'm going to show that. Okay. No, no. So anyway, um, so one of the main themes of Karna was that. Of social anxiety and inferiority complex. So during the graduation of the Pandavas, during the ceremony, Karna comes in, he kind of gate crashes and says, Hey Arjuna, whatever you have done, I will do better. Okay. Uh, so Karna kind of handled his social anxiety throughout the Mahabharata. You'll see this is something that is noticed, noted by one of my students by being boastful, overly generous, hungry for fame. And a loyalty to his status, his you know, he's really loyal to what he would then conferred upon him, the kingship, than anything else. And he says, so therefore, this is an example of how, how social anxiety and excessive, you know, obsession of what people think of us can distort one's natural behavior. So, you know, students share the experience of social anxiety while in the military, and also the college experience, like during one student shared. This time when during the pandemic they had online classes, so everyone was logging online with the video cameras on. So this veteran, you know, he was probably in his early 30s, his beard and his mustache, and he logged in. And then the other students, the 17 year olds, 18 year olds, they logged in also. And then immediately, when 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 they saw one of them saw him, uh, you know, they remarked in the, in the open classroom like, "Hey, what is this uh, trying to?" What is this? Uh, what is something like old ass guy doing? <laughs> something, something like that. Maybe made him feel really self conscious. You know? So this, uh, how do they deal with things like being made to feel that they're too old or uh, too too uh, too late for to get a college degree? Um, so, so one of the Thing to talk about is personal identity. To what extent do we have to be conscious of, of, of other people's opinions? To some extent, we have to, because society operates with certain, you know, uh, sort some sort of uh, a minimum amount of expectations. But to what extent? So one student said that yeah, it is the attention of other humans matter because one may be uncertain of one's own worth, whether they realize it or not, but. You know, our self identity is based on what, what other people think of us. Um, but someone else said, but you know, we have to be also really, at some point, we also have to have our own self confidence about who we are and what we can, uh, our, our own identity. You know? So, this is very interesting. This is not just relevant to veterans, again, this could be relevant to anyone else. Um, then we also talked about loyalty, how loyalty can be a trap. So, while Duryodhan, you know, he made Karna a king. To Karna, it felt like he was being empowered, but what Duryodhana was doing was basically purchasing Karna for his own purposes. So very similarly, when some of my the students, the veterans, when they're leaving the military, they are put under tremendous pressure to stay. You know, the officers come and tell them, hey, look, 
be loyal to, 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 you know, to the army or the Navy, you know, don't leave, be loyal to the country. What are you gonna do outside? You can't survive outside. In a few years time, you're gonna come back uh, falling here. Don't waste the time, you know? So they have to go through the internal uh, battle because a lot of pressure put on them not to leave. So then the question becomes, okay, so where do you have, you know, how can, can loyalty be a trap? Can loyalty end up becoming uh, self-reductive you know, to oneself? And then um, another student, Karna was also used as a, as a symbol of, of an appeal to marginalized people. There's one student in my class, he was black and he was gay. And he talked about how, you know, for him, he really connected with the Karna character. You know, he used his own words, he said that Karna has been shed on all, all his life. His mother abandoned him. He was cursed by his teachers. You know, he was rejected by Draupadi. He was insulted very often as the son of a charioteer. Uh, so of course he's going to be boastful. Of course he's going to try extra hard you know, to prove himself. So he, I, he and um, to the point he really I identified so much with Karna that at some point I asked a question in my class. Hey, if you could... Um, you know, um, meet Karna in a bar, would you go up to him, buy him a drink and sit next to him and talk to him or not? So the class is split about that. And then there's back and forth argument about Karna. And at some point that student who really identified with, with him had to get up and leave because he couldn't take people criticizing Karna. So anyway, uh, and then of course we talked about Arjuna. So Arjuna, the theme that came out uh, for Arjuna was someone who, who grows in adverse situations, okay? Um, you know, because uh, when Arjuna was exiled, the first exile, when he broke the marriage pact about Draupadi, uh, you know, he, he went around, he, he married a few other princesses, formed a few more alliances. And the second time he was exiled, you know, he, he was separated from the Pandavas, but he went, uh, to, he performed all kinds of you know, tapasya to get the, the Gandiva bow, the, the chariot, uh, divine powers, went to Indraloka, learned how to uh, dance, right? So the point is that, okay, how do you see adverse situations as opportunities to grow? What can you uh, do about that? So just like how Arjuna experienced separation from his family, his mother and his brothers, veterans experienced the same thing. Now what do you do? Or separation from your old buddies in the military. How can you use this moment to grow? Uh, female veterans share stories, how they thrive in male-dominated domin societies. They talk about how there's extra pressure on them. Uh, they're told, for example, even by their own female compatriots very often, that, hey, you shouldn't wear makeup. You should, uh, you know, there's just... You know, you should keep up, you know, it, it, they basically end up having to try extra hard. There's one student talked about how she, you know, she, she used that pressure to, you know, to enroll in various courses, really upgrade her skills and, and have a very fulfilling military career, actually. Um, there's another point I want, I want to mention is how Arjuna in chapter, the first and second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, he weighed the moral consequences of war. Uh, the, the trust was only looking at loss and profit. So this is something that I wanted to also encourage students. Let's, let's, let's not just look at victory or loss or how much profit you're going to make, but also what are the ethics behind it, morality? How is it going to affect other people? Uh, and they really appreciated that, especially because they didn't really have much of a say in the places they deployed to or the wars that they had to be engaged in. And of course, Arjuna's anxiety before the battle uh, was something that many students could relate to when his hands, his lips was trembling, his was firing, the Gandiva bow was slipping from his hand, uh, and he slumped on his, on, his, on his chair. So these were physical symptoms that they felt, hey, I went through that kind of mental breakdown myself too. And, and it was very refreshing for them that these experiences was shared, you know, thousands of years ago in the Mahabharata was composed, you know, like this, some very similar experiences. So. Uh, then we moved on to the Bhagavad Gita, naturally, from Arjuna. Uh, students like the concept of Karma Yoga very much. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's little pictures here I, want to, I forgot to mention. So these are, this is something that one of my students made because who, what, someone who identified with Karma is, 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 is a, the very chair is broken and it's stuck in the, in the mud. So similarly, um, 
Well, Arjuna, someone else made a bow and arrow. It's pretty good work. Like the Russians actually made this. Uh, and he identified Arjuna, um, uh, you know, this, this idea of being industrious, hardworking, uh, and, you know, trying to become really good at what, what uh, craft. So anyway, these are some stories for veterans. Um, so this, this person says that, you know, my reflection on karma yoga is doesn't mean that you have to become a hermit and give up the world. Uh, this is especially relevant to them. Now they finished the, the role in service, uh, serving the military. What do they do now? Are they going to cut up, cut themselves off from society? But no, it's a, instead learn to shift your mindset as you live and work in the world. Uh, and it says that if you really find something you like to do, it will not feel like work. And you do it for the sake of your work, selflessly. Easier said than done, but they appreciated the concept of karma yoga. And then this other person here, talked about how in the last duty station, they sunk into depression um, because they, wasn't, they, weren't, they weren't being recognized, the good work they were doing, and that ended up becoming like, a, you know, a vicious cycle or self fulfilling prophecy because then he stopped working hard. And by the end of his time in the military, I, was, I wasn't seen as a responsible airman who was left. And knowing what I know now, I wish I had adopted this concept of karma yoga and trying to find satisfaction uh, of doing, and doing my work uh, as best as I can. Maybe things would have gone differently. It's interesting reflection. So as part of the yoga team, we also invited uh, an instructor from this organization called Warriors at Ease, uh, just to teach them breathing techniques, uh, you know, meditation techniques, little exercises they can do every day just to relax uh, when they're experiencing stress, you know, when the, when the breathing gets a little bit more um, heavy, what do we do, what can we do? So, so we kind of extended that sort of um, hands-on experience to yoga for them. And then the next second last person is Ashwatthama. So Ashwatthama has you know, he, this is after his father, Dronacharya, was killed uh, in a very tragic way, if I can you know, say that. Uh, Ashutama is saying in the Mahabharata, where I sleep for the man who's suffering, my heart burns night and day, but never burns out. He's sleepless, he wants revenge. Okay, so of course, not many people have Ashutama's experience, but the veterans would really feel that, hey, Insomnia is a very common experience that veterans have because of the irregular hours that they had while works while serving and also due to PTSD. Um, so that's nice. Everyone said, hey, you experienced that too. I also experienced that. Okay, so what do you do? What do you do to get to sleep? You know, some said I have certain uh, rituals that I do, like, you know, some music, some meditative things, something which I read. It was just nice to hear them teaching one another about what they do to cope with something like, like insomnia. Uh, the final character and the one who was most discussed was Yudhishthira. So one of the things, uh, themes that emerged from Yudhishthira is, was Yudhishthira being realistic by trying to force a conflict-free world. And I asked this question because after the Rajashya Yagya, uh, Vyasa comes and tells Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira, you are going to be the cause, you may be the cause of a huge war in the Kuru dynasty. The Kuru dynasty may break apart because of you. Uh, and Yudhishthira hears that and he, he, he makes a re resolution that from now on he's going to be a yes man. He's just going to say yes to everything that anyone asks him, <laughs> especially you know, the elders like Mithrashtra. He's going to say yes because he wants he wanted a wide conflict. But him saying yes ended up in a huge war because he said yes to the gambling match and you know, you know the rest. So the question was is it possible? to expect a conflict-free world. And Yudhishthira himself changes. He undergoes a reformation later on in the Mahabharata. This is after the exile is over. And Mithrashtra sends Sanjaya as envoy to, you know, to talk about uh, peace. And Mithrashtra makes the uh, proposal, why, you know, why don't you Pandavas, you know, peace is the most important thing. Let's avoid conflict. Why don't you Pandavas just go renounce the claim to the kingdom? and go somewhere else, maybe Dwarka, go far away, somewhere else, go, go there and, and, and just beg. In this way, there'll be no conflict. Yudhishthira's response to that was, 
you know, I'm just as capable of peace as I'm of war. You know, I, I can be gentle and severe at the same time, so don't mess with me. <laughs> That's basically what he's trying to say. So how is this relevant to the veterans? After having served the military for five years, 10 years, 15 years, you want to go back to the civilian world, you're sick of conflicts in the military world, you know, in, 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 in military society. And then very often they might expect a, a utopian world where there'll be peace, you know, no, no more conflict, but that's not reality, right? Especially when the entire civil society is very polarized. What, you know, so they might get really frustrated. In other words, don't expect that you can create a conflict, conflict free world, uh, anticipate conflict and how you're going to engage with that. Uh, so this is something which one of my students said, what he got out of it for English year is adopt a friendly face to the world, be nice to everyone, be kind to everyone, but at the same time, don't allow yourself to be exploited. I was, I was quite happy with this reflection uh, that the student got and the student had. And uh, the other thing, another theme of English year was remorse. So this is him, you know, uh, after the war was over. He's saying, I've conquered this whole earth. But ever since finishing this tremendous extermination of my kinsmen, which is ultimately caused by greed, a terrible pain aches in my heart without stopping. This victory looks more like defeat to me. So the self question, what is that all about? What is all those years of service? So what is that war all about? This feeling of regret. Um, so our veterans could relate to that. They said, if I was a district, I would probably feel the same way. Um, you know, I can, I'll, feel, I'll feel remorse due to all the cruel things I did at war. I understand where it's coming from. Um, so this, ex, this acceptance, yes, I can really understand where this is coming from. Because while this year basically, he was, he was feeling so much remorse that he wanted to quit being the king. He wanted to go to the forest and be a hermit. And all the others, Arjuna, Krishna, were giving him a hard time. He said, no, hey, come on, this is this is a time. You know, this is a time for you to, to stand up. So. This other student said, he connected to that. He said that while it's unfortunate that the events that unfolded led to the war, what's done is done. You cannot change that. So let's move forward and ascend the throne. And it's admirable that he feels remorse for what has transpired, but remorse should lead him to do better as a rightful ruler and not just run away from ruling. So I really feel that this student was kind of using Yudhishthir to talk to himself and talk to others, saying that. Whatever it is, the past is the past. Now we're here, we're in a different world. So let's try to see what we can do, find our niche in this world, find out what we can do to serve in a different way. Okay. Um, and finally, Yudhishthira also has a theme of forgiveness. You know, he, for, he forgave Dhritarashtra. He said that, you know, he tells his brothers, the king, the trust should still be treated as a king. You should treat it, people you should still listen to his orders and obey his commands uh, and, and behave towards the trust just as you did before all of this happened. So a sense of reconciliation and forgiveness. Uh, interesting. So we compare Ashwatthama's vengefulness, feeling of wanting to take revenge, his hatred with the district's forgiveness. What is better for you in the long run? Okay, so this is something that a question that one of my uh, 